Welcome back, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from those of us who are on the East Coast, Rafael and me. Uh, I'm uh, really pleased this, this morning to welcome uh, Rafael Luciani, who is a Venezuelan theologian. Uh, he's appointed as an expert to the Theological Commission of the General Secretary for the Senate of Bishops of the Vatican, which is a recent appointment. He's officially appointed. He has great titles. One is expert. The other is Professor Extraordinarius. Uh, you have a longer biography of him in the uh, 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 biography book. Uh, but I think the important thing to say is just that um, uh, what he's known for is work around synodality. He certainly knows the pan-Latin uh, American church uh, quite well and was directly involved in the synod on the Amazon that you've probably heard a lot about. Uh, and he's been uh, called upon by uh, Pope Francis, by the church, to help us think about uh, uh, an attitude of synodality. He's going to talk about that today. I, I was struck that uh, uh, Cardinal Tobin said in a recent article that uh, synodality is a word so closely associated with the, Pope, uh, the papacy of Pope Francis uh, about collaboration, consultative decision makings, and he called it the, quote, most understood word about uh, Pope Francis. So after synods on, synods on young people, the Amazon, and the upcoming one, uh, we're pleased to have Raphael here to talk to us about synodality and to help us think about how the attitudes, perspective, ways of being, really, of synodality can improve life in the church and perhaps even have an influence on the way that we uh, teach and that our institutions govern themselves. So welcome, Raphael. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And well, welcome to all the people that are connecting. Uh, I think that what you just said is very interesting because synodality is uh, something new and at the same time not uh, well understood in some uh, context. So it, it's an opportunity now to, to see uh, some of the key elements that uh, conform this new way of being church synodality and what it implies in terms of reform in the church, because we need to reform it in order to be a synodal church. And uh, you have here like a, a, a way of understanding that we will be developing throughout the presentation. It's a, a reconfiguration of relations and communicative dynamics. And it has to do then with the way in which we interact, we see each other, we act, we interconnect uh, within an institution and uh, the level of personal relationships. I will go through five points uh, in the presentation. First, to present uh, this uh, crisis that we are living. How can we understand that the institutional model uh, inspired by a clericalist model is uh, today in a crisis that is a systemic a structural crisis. Therefore, in the second point, uh, the need the appeal to reform the church is a urgent and necessary uh, action that we have to take. In the, th in the third part, uh, how can we do that? Well, recovering the text and the spirit of Second Vatican Council. Uh, the Pope recently said that the council as the universal consensus of the church should be our guideline uh, in this path of synodality. Fourth, discerning the church in synodal key what elements uh, should we consider when we speak about synodality and reform? And finally, some uh, simple examples of a language and a form in a synodal church. Regarding the crisis of the institutional model, today, throughout different studies that has been done, one in Australia, another one by the German uh, bishops, and also several Latin American uh, theologians have said, as Francis reminds us almost every, every uh, couple of months, that clericalism is a real perversion in the church because clericalism confuses service with power. And this is uh, an interesting uh, way of understanding clericalism because it is a problem of the notion and the exercise of power in the church and in any institution. Ronaldo Muñoz, a Latin American theologian in the 70s said that clerical institutional structures are obstacles to discovery uh, of the gospel. And this is uh, why we need to reform. It's not simply an organizational 
a procedure, but uh, most of all, it has to do with the way in which the church presents and it is seen from the society and it transmits a message uh, around the good news of Jesus. So one first uh, thing that we have to be aware of is how to overcome clericalist relationships. And this happens not only in the church, but in the whole society. When we are saying clericalist, we're referring to uh, relationships in which we think that some, a few people are considered above ourselves. They're not ordinary people. In the case of the church, if we consider that some are sacred and therefore can be separated from the rest. These all are examples of relationships in which we are uh, being clericalist. Uh, another way to understand this is a phrase that Pope Francis used uh, in his second year uh, during his pontificate when he said the complex of the chosen one. It's a very interesting phrase because normally a, a person in the church sees him or herself as chosen and called by God in an individual way. When the Pope uses this uh, phrase, he's referring to the misunderstanding uh, when we bring together power, authority, and ordination in a minister, the ordained minister. When we mix these concepts, we have then a notion that is a, an authoritarian style of uh, exercising leadership in the church. We can say the same thing in any institution. If our leadership is hierarchical, if our leadership is uh, a, a one that imposes changes, all these ways of understanding leadership. The German bishops define clericalism as a hierarchical, authoritarian system. It is not about individual relationships, but it is a system in which laity, religious uh, women and men, presbyters and bishops are a part of that system and affected by that system. Other of the phrases that I love from Francis when uh, he is referring to a clericalist ecclesial uh, model, is uh, when he says the pathology of ecclesial power. There is a problem with power, with the notion and the exercise of power. Uh, one of the uh, most renowned canonists in the church has said that the problem of power within the people of God, within the church, is ultimately none other than the nature of the operational decisional relationship between all in the church, operational decisional relationship. Who is considered in the church to take a decision? Is that decision that is taken uh, worked through our a process with all the people? And is that decision representing a consensus? All these uh, ways of understanding decision taking has to do with synodality or with a, a clerical institutional model that remains in our church's institutions. So because we are now aware that there is a failure in the model of the institution, we can say that there is a need and it's an urgent need to reform it. When we uh, speak about reform, we're talking about first the mentality. What do we understand by Christian uh, civilization, Christian mentalities, values? If Congar uh, that you have here, he's one of the ecclesiologists uh, in the council, one of the most important in the 20th century. And he speaks that the crisis, the crisis has to do with this vision that is expressed at the same time in the structures of the church. So I, I need to change the mentality, the way I relate, and at the same time, the structures where I live and relate. Understanding that there is this need to reform the church, 
Pope Paul VI, during the Second Vatican Council, said a phrase that is very provocative and at the same time impelling. He called the Council Fathers to give, give a more complete definition of the church. The church needs always to find a more complete definition. It means that the institutional model changes throughout time because it should uh, respond to the signs of each epoch, to the signs of each time, and therefore it should be continuously in reform and change. That is why uh, when we talk about reform, we are uh, talking about all institutions in the church, university, a parish, a, uh, a office where pastoral planning is uh, thought and then put into practice, a diocese. And um, in this notion that Congar defines here of institution, he says, that an institution commonly designates a certain structure, relatively permanent, arising from by higher will, which responds to an objective or a utility, and in which individuals find a model for their behavior and an indicative of the role that corresponds to them in the group. So reforming institutions is not simply changing the mentality of one individual. Let's put an example. We reform a, an institution, but we have the same individuals with the same mentality that is a clerical mentality. That institution that was reformed will not work in a synodal way or vice versa. I, uh, I'm in a process of for forming a, a new mentality in the individuals that work in an institution but the structures of that institutions remain in a clerical state. That's why Congar always says that we need both conversion of mentalities, reform of institutions and structures. Pope Francis follows the Second Vatican Council that called for a continual reform or a permanent reform. We're not reforming in a one year or in two year basis, and then reforms are over. The notion of reform in the church should be a continuous work of renewal and of creating and recreating new structures. That is why we can uh, identify the two levels of a reform, a spiritual and a structural, but they need to go and be done at the same time. Uh, we have this phrase here that is uh, uh, illuminative, it's very provo provocative too, because when we only see the spiritual changes, Congar says that they're necessary, but not sufficient. Interesting, because normally we think that only changes should be private, individual, or towards the social sphere and action, but we don't see the, necess the necessity sometimes of reforming our own structures. And therefore, if we don't have these two elements together, we may be changing private experiences, but the church structures will be always a problem, an obstacle and not being witness in the society then we have to handle two dynamics while creating new structures and also recreating the ones that we have. And in that uh, dynamic, we may find that some structures are not anymore needed because they do not respond to the new signs of the times and the new epoch. That's why uh, this revision of traditional forms, they need to go beyond adaptation. It is not only about adapting new structures. The necessity when the cultural uh, setting changes, the necessity to create new structures. For example, interculturality today is a an important uh, notion because defines our subjectivity in the society. If a university 
if a school, a parish doesn't include this nature of our culture today, interculturality, and doesn't create new structures to respond to it, then we will have, again, a distance between the mentality and the structures in the church. The path to a reform is, first of all, recovering the Second Vatican Council. And when we say the Second Vatican Council, it's about a model of the church, a new model of the church. That model was expressed uh, by the council fathers in Lumen Gentium as people of God. People of God means, uh, let's put it in two relationships. First of all, that we are all equal, equal in rights, equal in duties, but especially when we say rights, this is something that we sometimes forget because rights mean that I have the right to participate, to speak, to have the census, to create consensus and not simply stay as an object, as a passive person, only assisting, for example, in the liturgy in the church. So this rights means engaging in the process of be in church, in the decision-making, in the decision-taking, in the governance at all levels in the church. Another way to understand the notion of people of God is the mutual need, as you see in the text, the mutual needs need among all the people in the church. This mutual need, need uh, thing uh, 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 is about what can each one of us, provide, contribute, and give that the other needs. And at the same time, what can the other provide and contribute to me that I need in order to complete my whole person, my subjectivity? Therefore, we can say that we are incomplete without being in relation to the other. The other completes my own personality. In the church, this is something that we sometimes forget. Among the different ministries, among the different uh, gifts, among the different services, all the relationships should be complementary and should be reciprocal. One of the words in the council that expresses that precisely is the word faithful, Christi Fidelis. Faithful is not a word to um, refer to have or not faith. It's a word that expresses the person being member of the church by reason of baptism and therefore having rights and duties as we were saying before. And faithful is a word that introduces us in a communitarian identity within a structure that is the church. And when I say communitarian identity, it means that we cannot define ourselves in anything we do in the church or in an institution of the church without incorporating the other and that other changing many times, sometimes my own point of view and completing each other's precisely because we need reciprocal relationships. Therefore, as uh, we have been um, uh, giving some keys, we can define synodality as this process of reconfiguring relationships and communicative dynamics. Uh, there is an image that was used in the Second Vatican Council uh, that uh, helped us to understand this change, this shift. It was the pyramid. Before the council, the pyramid was an image of the church where you had on the top the bishops and so, then the presbyters, then religious lay people at the end, at the base. And now when we talk about inverting the pyramid, as Francis says, recovering what the council fathers said in the, in the Vatican II, it means that we are all at the same level. It is an horizontal ecclesiology. It's a relational and dialogical model of the church. This today, so many years after the council may sound a commonplace, something that many of us uh, have heard, but the problem is not the form. We can speak about the uh, spirals or other forms. 
The problem is if we are uh, in the institutions of the church, living our relationships and communicative dynamics in a way in which we find ourselves complementary to each other and completing each other's vocation and life and service with uh, the desire and the need of the other and vice versa. Some keys to uh, reach that uh, way of being in church, some elements that we can uh, use for discernment. The church has gone through several reforms. This is not the first reform. But in the second millennium, the reforms that were done by the Gregorian reform and the Council of Trent were reforms that were intended to homogenize the church, unify the way in which, for example, transmission of the faith was done through catechism, formation was done through seminaries, and parishes were uh, centers of liturgical life. And you had a institution that in every country, in every culture uh, worked in the same way. With the Second Vatican Council, the church recovers the first millennium's identity of a church that is global, a world church, as Karl Rahner said, a church that is diverse in cultural expressions. That's why Francis from here uses the term synodality as a model for the third millennium. The third millennium means that we have to overcome the pyramidal clericalist model, second millennium. We have to renew the first millennium model of diversity and inclusion. And we have to recreate a new model because we're living in a new epoch, not in the first or in the second millennium. So he defines synodality as a constitutive dimension of the whole church. Constitutive means that the identity of the whole church, institutions of the church, anything that is uh, in the church has to be from now on in a process of discernment, revision, and change. We're not expecting changes to come from Rome. This means that the own institution has to start a process of revising the ways in which relations, communicative dynamics, structures work and function. In which way? First of all, involving the whole people of God, as we were saying before, a word from the council, in all the stages of an ecclesial process. We have here an example given by the International Theological Commission in a document on synodality. In a synodal church, the whole community, imagine the whole community can be any institutions I have, as I have been saying, is the free in the free and rich diversity. If I don't have the diversity of, this, of the members of that community represented, that's not a synodal church. Is called together to pray, listen, analyze, dialogue, and advise. But all these actions done together have the scope to take decisions. We have in universities and schools ministries, and we have uh, groups that pray together. We have listening groups, even. We have groups that analyze, reading groups, etc. But when we are talking, of a synodal church is how do we integrate all these experiences to, in a process where every person can say, I contributed to a decision that is shaping this institution. Therefore, it's not a top to bottom uh, model, but a bottom to top model. Another way uh, to understand a synodal church is uh, using the word participation and co-responsibility. Participation is a word that helps us to integrate, involve all people, but participation is not simply given a space, to give a space to another person that doesn't have or had before a space there. It's not simply that. It's a way of interacting. How do I take part of 
and take part of discernment, of decision-making, of decision-taking. Participation is a very uh, committed work to changing structures if we understand well this word. That's why in a church that is participative, is not a church that only is thinking in giving a space to those who are not yet in the church, but giving part, taking part and constructing all together that same community. That's why participation has to be linked with the other word, corresponsibility. Because I am not responsible individually. My responsibility has to do with the other and the other with me. I'm co-responsible. When we talk about governance or accountability, it's not only about the person that is accountable, the other, but it's also about me. When I silenced myself, when I saw something, I was not co-responsible in that process of being accountable as a whole, as a church, not simply as an individual. That's why the dynamics, the communicative dynamics have to be reciprocal. They have to be binding. They have to be a listening, listening dynamics through different mediations, mediations. Which are the mediations that in a Catholic institutions are normally understood? Well, we can have here uh, some of them that uh, the canonist Borras uh, describes the listening to the gospel, silence prayer, rereading of life and events. But the last one is what is proper to a synodal church, the confrontation of points of view, not simply the integration of diversity in terms of people, persons, but of their way of thinking, of their way of seeing reality, even in the way they write and they express uh, something in the academia or in any institution. This confrontation of points of view is what is at stake today in a synodal church, because we uh, normally don't believe that the spirit is speaking through the confrontation of points of view, only through what I want to hear that it goes with my own way of being. Therefore, the challenge, the challenge is how do we think our institutions in the church in a way that they can work building consensus at all levels? Integrating people has one scope to build consensus. Consulting people has the same scope to build consensus. Why then in the church we are not yet in this logic in this way of relating, in this way of communicating, where the consensus becomes the central, the core of the life of a church institution. A bishop of the first millennium that can help us to illuminate this path is Saint Cyprian. And he always exercised his uh, power with two key elements. First, he did nothing, as he says, without the advice of the presbyters, his most near collaborators. But at the same time, that advice was in order to make a consensus, build a consensus with the whole community, with the whole people. So you have the two elements here, taking, asking and taking advice and building consensus. If we do consultation processes in an institution, and that is only to have like a poll, to know information, to know trends, but it's not a information to then be discussed, discern, and help me to build consensus, that's not a synodal model. That can be a clerical model. So we have two ways then of proceeding. In the clerical model, I don't build consensus. I only ask for advice, but then I decide alone. In the synodal model of the institution, I need always to build consensus. Therefore, 
one of the biggest challenges is how do I link decision-making processes in an institution and decision-taking processes in that same institution? If my decision-making doesn't uh, link what is a uh, make discern thought in that process to the ones that take the decision, then we are again in a clericalist model. To put an example, in Latin America, in 1968, we had the second general conference of the Episcopate. And in that conference, the bishops came uh, with most of them a model of the church that was clerical because they were very uh, in the initial stage of the reception of the Second Vatican Council. So all of them had a study before the council. Throughout the discussions in the assembly, they started to uh, integrate the lay people, the religious, others from other uh, confessions, and working in the same uh, groups, they started to change. Some of the bishops at the end said that they ended the conference with a completely new view of the church as they came uh, to the conference uh, in the first day. Why is that possible? Because the working together means that those who take decision have to participate in the process of making the decision with the others. Because the only way I can change is when I am person to person talking, trying to understand, trying to see the other's culture in a personal and relational way. In this sense, then we have a, in this challenge to form synodal attitudes, not simply contents of knowledge uh, in each course that we may provide as an academia, but how can we form a subject, a human subject that really has these synodal attitudes, the ability to listen, for example, the willingness to learn from others, not only from books, from others. And that means uh, something that uh, Francis always remembers, the contact with reality. I only change when I have the a personal contact with the other's reality. I may be listening and seeing the news every day of what's happening there or what's happening in other countries. Only when I am shocked by the reality, when I live and co-share that reality, I start to change in my own view, in my own experience. That's why synodal attitudes imply experiences experiences with the other. And the other way to understand these synodal uh, attitudes is how do we mature ideas? How do we have information available without any uh, closure that we want to hide, sometimes information? How do we put that information and be accountable how do we lead to decision-making processes of all together participating? In another uh, way to see this is when we have meetings, when we have exchanges, when we have working groups in an institution, what are they for? What is the scope? Just to uh, have a nice time exchanging opinions or is the scope of that meeting to change the persons that are there in order to change the institutions where they are. So if this changing element is not seen, then we're not in a synodal church. And this is very interesting because when we speak about changes, in Latin America, we understand, and that's why Paul Francis uses a lot of this expression, processes. And processes uh, means that changes cannot be imposed, they cannot be a uh, decree. So you need a process and the process means personal relationships and the process means listening to each other and trying to put myself in the life of the other and vice versa. And in a classroom where you have people from all nationalities, 
that's very um, that's a place where you can see that very directly because you have cultures where the way of writing and the way of speaking are different and not because they're better or they're not better or they're worse or they are it's not about that it's about the way of being human that we are only being human in cultural forms if i do not know that when i do my grading or when i read a a, a, a work that is being done a paper i may be judging with my own cultural form of being human, of being professor, and not uh, integrating and knowing and respecting the other's uh, cultural form in all that the other does. So you have uh, there an example of how can we have diversity, but not be working in a diversity style of being, integrating uh, the other's cultures. Three, uh, ways of seeing how can we move forward in synodality in any institution is to enhance styles that uh, that means styles of living uh, ways in which i am accessible to the other relating uh, i had once a, a person that uh, was working and uh, this person liked what what she was doing but then at some point uh, I needed something and it was uh, after five o'clock and it was really urgent. And the person responded, uh, my working time is off, so you have to wait till tomorrow. If I am uh, in Italy, if I am in a Latin American country, the first thing you do is the relational, not simply the professional need of the other. And sometimes you just go to take a coffee with this example, it may sound funny, but you just go to take a coffee and while speaking and relating, you're building a much more than a, a mere professional relationship. In both cases, it's about culture. There is not one culture that is better than the other. It's about recognizing that these are two ways of relating, of being, of understanding work, of understanding life. And if I do not know that, integrate that, then I will have always conflicts. So culture is the base of synodality, understanding culture. A second a help that we can have to move forward is how do we build structures that enhance and they can then reinforce these attitudes that are given by synodality. For example, if I, in a structure, only work according to scopes and effectivity and time, or if I work according to processes, that may take longer, but they may be more effective and they are effective and effective and not simply effective. So structures, the way we envision structures, the way the structures function and connect to each other. Sometimes we have uh, four offices in a school, in a faculty, in a office, in a, in a structure in the university and they are not interconnected and they may be doing the same thing in different ways and because they're not interconnected they uh, do not work together providing a better experience with different views instead of overlapping activities so the structures the fluent dynamics are also part of a synodal style to put an example in in the vatican uh, the revision of the structures has to do, for example, with the way in which the curia uh, right now works, where you have sometimes only uh, prefects uh, that only say what they did, but they do not revise what they did. So when we're speaking about the structures, it's not about informing it's about working together, all the different departments and trying to figure out a common vision, a common plan. In Latin America, this is a, an example that may help. Since the uh, 50s, um, the structure that helped 
to build a regional vision of the whole church was the Council of the Latin American Bishops, Salam. And today we have a, a region with a common vision, but in each local church, in each country, that vision is inculturated according to the needs of that reality. But all together, all together, they have one shared vision, how to be an institution, how to work, how to engage with society. So the interconnection of structures. And finally, the events. Uh, an event may be a consultation process in a university, a consultation process in order not to be informed only, but to take part then in the process of discernment and decision taking in that university. There is a diocese in Austria, the only one in the world, one diocese, that selects and votes for the bishop that is going to be appointed there. This comes from uh, the practice of the second millennium that was respected and today is still there in that diocese. That's a way of understanding how the community can participate until the last stage when someone is elected, in this case, uh, of a diocese. So to end, some uh, ideas uh, to build a language and to build a form of a synodal uh, community, institution, church. Pope Francis gives us three keys when uh, we're talking about this language this is spirituality embraced by synodality. How do we integrate mind, heart, and hands? That means that sometimes we separate the professional work, as I put in some examples, my time during the day, I try to split it. Instead here, it's about integrating mind, hearts, and hands, gestures, ways of uh, relating, creating an environment, and that's a synod of spirituality. Uh, in the synods, the most successful decisions are not taken inside the uh, synodal assembly, but within the halls, in the dialogues, in the personal relationships, where people talking start to see the others culture, the other's point of view, and start to discern what is happening there and change. A second is uh, the option of a synodal diaconia. That means the social engagement of an institution as part of its identity. Cry for the earth, its ecology today, cry of the poor, the option for the excluded, for those who are not integrated in the church today. And Francis uh, puts this in two questions. No? What does this earth need of us today? What can a university provide in that direction? Where are your brothers and sisters? Are the students only living their own life in the classroom? Or are the students being engaged and connecting what they learn and what they experience and make that a whole of uh, their only and one study as a uh, subject that integrates all its dimensions. To end, this is an image that I always like to show because Ronaldo Muñoz, the Latin American theologian who wrote it, was the first after the council to write in Latin America a book about the reform of the structures of the church. And he envisioned this image Remember, we started with the pyramid, and this is another image. This is an image where reconfiguration of relations and communicative dynamics are taken into consideration. A community of men and women, diversity, who are open or free, they can talk freely without any hesitation that they're going to be fired or they're going to be expelled, who cooperate responsibly, co responsibility, as we saw, Living in an attitude of permanent self-criticism and search, this permanent reform, continual renewal, in which all participate actively. I don't only hear the other to get information, but I involve that other to take part in. 
at all levels, at all levels. That means that not only where I work in my own department, but at all levels of the uh, institution. And finally, the participation takes then from the uh, lower point to the top. And this means that every person in an institution has something to say in the common good of that institution. We have to learn then in the culture, in our institutions, how to build consensus, integrate the whole community, and how we can link that uh, in order to shape a community, to shape an institution in the church and overcome this clericalist model in which we are all living because it's a systemic and a structural problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafael. There's a lot that we could take away from that. We have one question there, but let me ask you a clarifying question because it came up a couple of days ago from a participant who was new to understanding the Catholic intellectual tradition. And she heard, the, here's the phrase option for the poor. And in English, it sounds like I could choose yes, I could choose no. So you talked about the option of a synodal diaconia. Can you help us figure out that word option, what it means, what's missing in English about that interpretation of it? Yeah, it's a tricky word exactly because of uh, it, it could mean no, optative. And sometimes even adding preferential could also mean that that is optative. No? Uh, in the Latin American theology, it's not optative. Uh, option means of fundamental identity. Uh, an option that I do defines my whole identity as person or, or as an institution. So that's why the option is the fundamental uh, way in which my identity is expressed. Uh, so for the poor, it's interesting in, in some universities, in, in Caracas, for example, the Andres Bello, the Jesuit University, the big component of the pastoral uh, ministry that they have is to work directly all the schools, the students from all the schools in popular neighborhoods. So it's not about a, a, an intra-campus ministry, but it's about going outside. And then the activities that they could have in the campus, they do them outside in the communities. So these are ways of, of understanding that the social needs to be integrated in the university and not that the university brings the speech of the poor uh, to a classroom and that's, that would be enough. No? Great. So I'll encourage uh, our participants to put something in the chat or the Q&A if you'd like, and I will follow those. Uh, one question that is there is, what do you see as a healthy balance between constantly rebuilding structures and enjoying a sense of stability and enduring this? Yes, that's, um, that's very interesting because it's uh, also a way in which synodality can or not or cannot work. If I am only expecting a stability that will be permanent, then the structures will never respond to each time. Uh, one year and a half ago when we didn't have the pandemic, and now year and a half after the pandemic, we cannot have the same structures. Because in just a period of one year and a half, the epoch, not the time, the whole epoch changed. I was talking the other day with a parish and we were talking about how the digital spaces have to become a ministry today, not simply an activity. And that needs to recreate ministries because we're talking now that groups do life throughout these platforms from all parts of the world. And this is not simply a network that is being used as a tool. This is becoming, as Pope Francis has said, an habitus, a, a home where you can interact and, and even make life. So this is a new way of understanding that something changed. I need to think it very differently as we used it one year and a half ago. Another question in the Q&A. In my parish, the pastor directs everything. I do not think he would be open to synodality. What is there for me to do besides finding a more synodal parish? Yes, there is a, a structure in the parish that uh, we all know, the, the uh, parish council. The way in which it works 
it could be or not synodality uh, in practice. For example, in many parishes, uh, we're doing now a reform in Venezuela that is called the reform of the parish as community of communities. And the proposal is that the parish is only the center where many communities all around the parish are built. And each community has its own coordinator, leader, or ministry. And then that community parish in the center is where this council uh, is exercised and all the leaders and all the movements that do life in that parish, then in the council work out the decisions that they need for the whole community. So it's a problem of mentality. The priest needs to change the mentality. And it's a problem of clericalism because as a lay person, I have to exercise my duty and my right that that should change. So I guess that that's something that we sometimes uh, miss, no? that I have rights and I have to request my exercise of my rights in the church, not only in the society. So this is a new culture, of course. Let me ask, um, you're, we're certainly talking about the parish level or diocesan level. When most people look at synodality and they look at something uh, on TV, when they're going to look at the synod you've been involved in or the next one, they're going to see overwhelmingly bishops, cardinals, uh, whether they even see your picture in the photograph as a layman anywhere there is questionable. So uh, maybe there are one or two women involved. I mean, how do people really begin to think about synodality as the big process that you're thinking of when the, 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 the visuals of it, uh, what we see looks pretty hierarchical and clerical right now? Yes, uh, synods are just one of the many structures of synodality, but synods were born as a collegial episcopal structure. They're not synodal structures. So if we want to change uh, the church towards a synodal model, it's not about changing the synod, it's about synodalizing the whole church. So for example, uh, the new synod, the coming synod, is not anymore uh, working from top to bottom. It's starting from the communities, dioceses, Episcopal Conference, international assemblies, and then the synod. This is a new way of proceeding. Uh, that means though it will be a practice that will say if it's uh, successful or, or not, but it's a change in the mentality. The other thing is that we cannot expect a synodality to be changed only through a synod, because a synod, again, is just one structure, and it needs to be uh, right now the challenge to create a new structure. And in Latin America, there is a new structure. And, and this is interesting because it's a cultural, again, uh, experience. People say, well, there is nothing in the church that is changing. And I always tell them, well, in Latin America, we just created last year a SEAMA. It's a, a ecclesial conference, which is not an Episcopal conference. And this year is going to have its fir a first ecclesial assembly where the same number of lay priests, religious and bishops are going to participate. There are not going to be more bishops than lay people. And that's a change. But if I see the changes only where I live and I don't see any changes, I would generalize uh, synodality in that regards. So I have to also open to see what is happening in the rest of the church. This is one limitation that I find in, in some countries, not only in the US, in, in, in some European countries too, that we only look to our own experiences and our own way of being church here. And the church is universal, it's global. So we have to learn from other experiences and that's synodality. But then we have to want to see what is happening. That's the problem. Agreed entirely. Uh, last question, what can colleges and universities do about this? Is this a process that's largely happening apart from us? Can we contribute to it? Whatever our difficulties, we're certainly among the stronger set of institutions uh, in the post-abuse crisis Catholic Church in the United States. So is there a role for us in this? 
Yes, and there is a very important role because the impact of a university right now with the pandemic, we have seen that it's not only local or nation, it's also international uh, through all these tools. Uh, and one of the things that is going to be needed and starting to be implemented towards the next synod is formation because most of the bishops, priests, lay people don't know what is synodality. So one of the things is how do we create programs through our universities to make this formation accessible to many people and at least uh, give them desire to know more. I guess that's a key right now of the universities, the schools, because of the impact that they can have in the society and in the church. Uh, many people ask, where can I know this? Well, the universities have platforms, the universities have the ways to outreach uh, much more better than a parish. So I guess that's a way of collaborating. Thank you. I know we have one more question, but unfortunately we need to end because I have to give our participants time to move on to, uh, to their next event. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a webinar. You can't see the, the clapped hands from, from the participants, unfortunately, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the clarity of your presentation, for the hope it gives us, and for the real uh, cross-cultural look at uh, where we are and how to uh, change reform structures and hearts at the same time. So thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you, Tom, and thank you all. A big hug. <laughs> <laughs>